I think in this industry, great leaders of the businesses absolutely have to have some understandings of or some experience of working in or overseeing a trading business. Trading is the heart of any unregulated business, even an unregulated retail business, as we've just found out, right, Remind, being reminded so well. And it's absolutely imperative that business leaders understand how you manage those risks inherent in the commodity market. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Feddersen, founder and chief executive of Aurora. And today I'm delighted to be speaking with a veteran of the European power sector. My guest is a prolific director in the UK utility sector. Uh, Among his roles, he's a non-exec director at SSE, which is one of the largest listed power utilities. He's the chair of Infinite Energy Management, which is a renewables generator uh, from landfill gas and other technologies. Uh, and he's also had a small number of not-for-profit directorships. In his previous executive roles, he was a CEO of Eon's UK business during uh, a period of great change over the last decade or so, in which uh, the GB retail market went from very few suppliers to a large number of them, and I think also a period in which many of the seeds for the current challenging state of affairs in the GB retail market was sown. Before this, he was CEO of Eon Energy Trading. So he's a power trader and was responsible for commodity risk management there. Uh, And he's held before that various roles from early privatization in the GB power market and European power markets with Eon and its predecessor, PowerGen. And finally, and perhaps most impressively uh, to me as a failed mathematician, Uh, He has a PhD in maths from Oxford, so very good at maths. My guest on the show is Tony Cocker. Welcome, Tony. Hello, John, uh, and thank you for inviting me. No, great to have you on. Uh, So I'd I'd like to pick up a few strands of that illustrious career that that I just detailed. So first of all, I didn't mention this, but you worked for a brewery in the 90s in strategy from 1993 to 1996 for Bass, which is a big British brand or was a big British brand. Why? It was a short-lived career in brewing. It was three years. Why did you decide to leave and go into the power sector in the mid-90s? Yeah, sure. Um, So so prior to that, I'd worked in strategy consulting and I moved to Bass in the strategy team at Bass. Uh, I did fully intended to stay there for a while uh, and Bass had a great track record of moving people from strategy into general management, which was my ambition. But uh, PowerGen, as it were, phoned me up um, with the opportunity to be to lead the strategy function at, at PowerGen. Um, and it just seemed a fascinating industry to get into at that time. So ni- that was 1996, shortly after privatization and just before the residential retail market was uh, liberalized. And so f- fascinating time strategically for PowerGen. And interestingly, in brewing, brewing had just gone through what we call the beer orders, which disrupted vertical integration. Um, uh, And so there's some interesting strategic lessons from brewing uh, that may be uh, applicable to energy or electricity. Yeah, interesting. Yes, they were, of course, the big six brewers back in the day. They owned the pubs, they owned the, the breweries, and, yeah. and that was yeah. that was dismantled. So not 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 not, not dissimilar, dissimilar to yeah. to what we've seen. It's interesting. You say it was a period of of sort of excitement and change. We, you know, I think they, like the 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 kind of the. The way the straw man description of the power sector is, you know, it used to be a bit dull and boring and and regulated and all of those things. And the energy transition and renewables is making it more exciting, but that's a more recent phenomenon. So it's striking to hear someone say that mid nineties was a period of great excitement in power markets as well. Do you, is it, would it be easy for you to say 
you know, which in which period the rate of change was larger? Is it now or was it in the mid nineties, um, you know, early privatization period? I don't. Think, I I absolutely don't think it's that easy to say the, where the rate of change is 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 faster. Um, you know, the the nineties was it was about deregulation. There was um, you know there was the, the the U.S. utilities were entering the U.K. market, Enron, for example. So huge, huge change also inspired, inspired by that. New technology, there was a dash for gas. So CCGTs were being built. Um, and, um, and people thinking about what was the right business model to, in which to, to operate. And then the residential market being uh, liberalized. You know, people who no, had no experience of that prior moving into that uh, starting to work in that sector so so there was really quite a, that's quite a high rate of change whether that's higher or lower than today's you know i think given the challenges of the energy energy transition you've got to bet that today's is at least as high a rate if not higher but yeah, so, yeah. interesting and in the uk it is i i uh, the number of people who speak very fondly of the mid nineties. Now, maybe as a function of how much money the power generators were making, and it was a bit of a duopoly. But it, it is, it's striking how many people say that. I think in Germany, people often talk about the two thousands as 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 that sort of wonderful period. You know, Eon I think was at one point the most valuable company on the DAX index. Um, so anyway, it's, it's come back it, to that probably. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's striking. Another strand I wanted to pick up is, is the maths PhD. Um, why, I mean, why did you study maths in the first place? I, I suppose, so I, given you said you wanted to go into, you know, you, you wanted to own a P&L within a, a corporate. Um, yeah. So, but, but I think, you know, the, the um, why did I study maths? I enjoyed it. I was, I was, I was good at it in very broad terms. I thought it would be a good basis for the future. I think you know back then I I did not have a very good idea of what what I wanted to do. You know, I, I, there was um, you know I didn't necessarily want to get want to go into general general management. I didn't really know what general management was, so so it was it was it was kind of the next step. I definitely want knew, knew I wanted to go to university. Was uh, you know lucky enough to be able to go to Oxford, as you said, um, and uh, yeah, just happened to be good at maths. Yeah. Do you think it helped throughout your career being a being a PhD, being a doctor, and in maths? Yeah, no, I do. I think there's first of all, it, the it gave it gives you a set of skills. So you know the analytical rigor, the P, the PhD. You know, it's a very big self directed project at the start of your your career, um, and. Um, I think also there's a bit of mis- mystique apply as, uh, that, that comes with uh, a maths PhD because they're not you know, they're not that frequent, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, which I think is a good thing. And I think I, I as an as a non-Brit, uh, you know, I I think there is, uh, you know, I think there's a reverence, or in the UK at least, there's a sort of you know, academia is you know is held in high regard in general in the UK. Um, unlike in some other some other countries, so it doesn't surprise me to to, to hear that. Yeah. If you were graduating now, let's say you're graduating with a maths PhD now, and you want to go into the power sector, where would you go? Where would you start your career right now? And 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 be, beware, there are quite a lot of students and graduates who listen to this podcast, so you, you may <laughs> right. well be having an impact on the world. Well, I, I mean, I think the first thing to say is it would be a great the power sector full stop would be a great place to start yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and as you pointed out i didn't start in the power sector um and, and but i think if i was graduating now i think it, with the energy transition just there are so many opportunities in the power sector and you know it will be growing so substantially that it's just a great place to be so first thing is pick the power sector the second is where within the power sector. Actually, I think you could make a choice in whether it might be in the network business, it might be in the generation business or a, or a, a, a net zero generation business or a pure play renewable business, or it might be a retail, retail business or a trading business. In a way, it's sort of uh, all of those would be interesting. I think uh, for my particular personality and skill set, um, and just appetite. If I was now 
just coming out of a PhD, I would go into either renewables or trading as a first step. Yeah, yeah. Just to add to that list, Tony, and, and with all of my biases implicit here, you could also go into power modeling or analysis. <laughs> you and, could. And, oh, and, sure. I, and I do think, I often say, people laugh at this, but I do think understanding the economics of power dispatch and markets is actually a really important life skill in general. Uh, so you could do worse than, than a couple of years on the fundamentals of the economics yeah, of power. Yeah, I, 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 agree with, I agree with that. Um, oh, yeah. good. Okay, so one of those areas was trading. Um, you're a tr- you you led a trading business. Uh, you know, and there are a lot of traders, I, I think, in the power sector that become leaders within their businesses. Do, do you think power traders? But but I suppose at the same time, there's this sort of there's this sort of canonical you know in trader who doesn't like managing people, who's mercurial and brilliant in and of themselves. Um, but you know, sits in front of a screen all day and isn't the classic manager. Do you think traders make good leaders and managers in the power sector? I think some do, some don't. I think, it's, it's, as you I, I put it in my words, would be maybe mercurial, but you know, some power traders, they just want to trade or manage risk um, and they don't want to lead. And then Power trading is an atypical environment in which to learn people leadership skills. Um, you know, for example, actually, if you go back to the beginning of my career, as you highlighted, brewing, running pubs is just a great place to learn about people management skills and stakeholder management skills. Yeah, yeah very, very different. Um, nevertheless, some really good people and business leaders do emerge from trading. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, for example, actually, at the moment, I'm very fortunate to work with Martin Pibworth at SSE. And yeah. I think, you know, he's super, you know, his background is in trading, but he's a super business leader. Um, and, and I you know, really enjoy working with him. But I would flip your question, actually. I think in this industry, great leaders of the businesses absolutely have to have some understanding of or some experience of working or overseeing a trading business so that you re- ab- so that you know the trade trading is the heart of any unregulated business even an unregulated retail business as we've just found out right remind being reminded so well um, and it's absolutely imperative that business leaders understand how you manage those the, those risks inherent in the commodity markets? Yeah, yeah, it is a commodities business. Uh, yeah, this year the the British retail market's going to end with probably less than half of the number of of, of firms in it that it had at its yeah. peak. Yeah, uh, and I think you'd attribute much of that, not all of it, to uh, commodity risk risk management. Yeah. So it's 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 a it's a good point. Yeah, and, and I mean the idea. Yeah. And I think your your Martin point, you're obviously hugely strategically astute. You know, there's some, I think it relates to my point about power, you know, power market analysis, which is if you understand, you know, the merit order and dispatch and competition and 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 what entry does to prices and value, uh, that that puts you in a pretty good place to start making strategic decisions about yes, an energy absolutely. an energy business. Yeah. Um. What. This is a question I asked Georg Arsen from NASDAQ recently. Mm. Uh, he's seen a lot of traders. Yeah. What do you think determines long-run performance in power trading? And, and I suppose one observation I would make on that, going back to the, ni- the mid-90s, is it used to be that there were a lot of banks, You know, a lot of the big Wall Street mm. banks were involved in trading. They're not anymore for whatever reason. W- what's enabled people to stick around and, and perform well in power trading? Okay, so I, th- so I think... From an, ind- from an individual point of view, yeah, what, why, what enables individuals to stick around in trading and to be successful over you know, a number of years is this sort of combination of you know, curiosity, analytical rigor, attention to detail, discipline, resilience, um, and for optimization and whether trading is part of a broader you know, broader business and ability to engage with the upstream asset manager or the downstream retailer and really understanding the markets in detail um, 
the risks in their position, their edge and their view, um, rigorously de-risking where they don't have um, an edge and being thoughtful about putting on a position where they do have an edge uh, and being disciplined about getting out when necessary and then being resilient when they get it wrong because they will get it wrong, but being resilient and being able to, 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 to bounce back and constantly scanning for new data. So I think that's about the individuals. I think the corporates, you know, the, why did the banks exit? I think it's about capital requirements as much as anything else. Uh, post the financial crisis, they, you know, the capital requirements are on, on banks and trading increased uh, and uh, the, 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 the return for the capital they had to invest was, uh, was insufficient. But you'd have to ask a bank. Yeah, yeah, in- interesting. Um, and interesting observations on the on the on the psychology of successful trades. Yeah. I mean, it didn't sound too dissimilar to the psychology of great leaders, right? It's sort of you know humility, humility around you're going to get things wrong. You know, broader engagement, engagement with the broader business and, and communication and stakeholder yes. management. Yeah, um, yeah. Because so I, I think your point about the mercurial trader, your is will be fine in a spec team. But, yeah. but actually in an optimization team, you, you need those guys who can get out and talk to the, talk to the asset, the, the people in operations and the power stations and the people in retail. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So, so I, I want to change the focus a bit from your career and your journey to some of the organizations you are or have been involved with. Uh, and I start with Eon. So one of the big topics I spoke to Markus Kreber, who's, who's obviously RWE CEO, uh, and he was the RWE CFO uh, up until recently about was, you know, the, the big corporate moves in the German power sector, which was basically, you know, RWE um, and E.ON splitting up their fossil fuel and their, and their renewables network businesses, retail businesses in general, a few bells and bells and whistles on each, but, but that was it. And then RWE taking all of the, the generation assets um, and, and, uh, and E.ON taking all of the network assets and some of the retail um, so he gave me the, uh, so and in a sense, RWE and Eon are making the opposite bets, right? So one's taking a certain kind of asset, getting rid of the rest. One's taking out. Now, of course, that's not always the case because there are, you know, you, there's a natural set of assets to own all together and those, those sorts of things. Really interested to hear from you on the Eon perspective on this, because you were, you were obviously around and heavily involved at the time. So maybe could you start by giving me a bit of background on, on sort of where Eon was prior to the demerger? Yeah. Okay. And, and let's just to be clear, I wasn't there for the demerger, but I was there for the, um, the previous round of change when they s- spun off Uniper. And I was you know, there for some changes that predated predated that so so i think you you sort of set the context um if i kind of go back to 2005 by then eon was a uh, holding company which had owned power and gas utilities in a number of markets across europe obviously from its german base but also in sweden uh, Netherlands, um, the UK, and then a number of uh, the Czech Republic, etc. Um, so, uh, and and earned and, and owned utilities in in those those markets, uh, and had expanded out of its German uh, German base, Heartland. Um, at that time, the you know, the, the European power markets were were opening up, uh, and the boilerplate. You know, liquidity was improving, and the boilerplate was 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 was, was developing. Carbon trading was developing, um, and th- it was also bec- becoming clear that the industrialization opportunity in renewables was coming. So, for example, in two thousand and four, I think it was, we opened Scroby Sands in the UK, which was Eon. PowerGen's first significant offshore wind farm, um, which in today's terms was very small, but you could see the the opportunity, uh, the significant scaling up opportunity coming from that. So, Eon, um, uh, uh, you know, Eon and 
the senior executives in Eon said, okay, uh, and, the, and the board said, okay, how, what's the right way to run Eon to, we've got these assets, what's the right way to optimize these businesses? Um, and Eon set up three, a number of global businesses. So the trading business, um, uh, ECNR, uh, so the renewables business, and subsequently also a generation business. And, the, and these businesses were, it was taking the, uh, not, not, it was taking the leadership of the generation business from the, the utility, the local utility, and taking the, the leadership, the responsibility for the operations and maintenance and putting that, leading that from a central hub. The same, you know, building renewables was gonna be led from a central hub. Built, trading was gonna be in a central hub. Uh, and then the, the, the local utilities were, the, the local team was responsible for stakeholder management, networks and re, stakeholder management across the piece, and then networks and retail. So that was the that was the picture, um, and um, that was driven by say economies of scale, and that was the picture in. It started to emerge in two thousand and five. We implemented that in two thousand and seven, and you know as you, you talked about my career earlier. You know, so, so I became the CEO of Eon Energy Trading, and and I, uh, in parallel, ECNR came out of the blocks, bought Etricity US. Um, bought another a renewable company in, I think, in Spain, and really started getting to critical scale, and was building wind farms on both sides of the North Sea, developing wind farms on both sides of the North Sea. So that you know that was uh, optimizing those assets. When you get then to, um, to th around two thousand and fourteen, um, post Fukushima. Uh, I get undoubtedly the financial perform. You know, the, there were some challenges in the financial performance, and undoubtedly that sharpens the sharpens the thinking. And uh, within the group, we were saying, actually, our span now is is broad, is quite broad, um, and having the talent that can, the capability, the intellectual capability to to really develop talent and run to and across all of those those businesses to allocate capital across all of those businesses and to have a very clear and simple message to stakeholders including regulators and policymakers across all of those business areas is becoming more challenging so let's split into two businesses um let's, let's, and the the split between Eon and Uniper was sort of Uniper was fossil generation and trading and Eon Hor gas, so the long-term gas contracts. And then Eon was renewables, retail, and networks. And Eon also retained the nuclear business. Okay. So that was and that was driven by so the first set of decisions were driven by scale, getting scale economies. And the second set of decisions were driven by focus in very simple, simple terms. And so that, that's the split between Uniper and Eon. Then the sort of the subsequent asset swap, networks and retail for renewables. I was outside, so you might want to um, ask uh, you know, Leo Birnbaum or uh, Mark, Mark Speaker or Johannes Tyson about that. But my reflection from the outside was, Actually, it's kind of simple. You've got two growth businesses now, each of you. You've got, well, from an Eon perspective, and Marcus Kerber, as you say, answered from an RWU perspective, but from an Eon business, you've got two growth businesses. You've got renewables, clearly a growth, growth business where you're going to grow globally. And you've got networks, also clearly a growth business now, enabling the energy transition. And then you've got retail, a potentially an opportunity as we have to you know, get more into uh, the prosumer um, and energy solutions. So you've got, whether it's two or three growth, growth businesses there, plus the nuclear in the case of, uh, of Eon and also in the case of RV. Um, so, I don't, so I don't think it was, uh, so I think effectively the choice then for the Eon board is, okay, if I do this asset swap, I, I 
rather than having two growth businesses, I've got one growth business, which is networks plus retail, I'll call it sort of rather than uh, yeah, rather than three growth businesses, I've got two but two growth businesses, networks plus retail, but I've got them twice the scale that I had before. So it's it's more again, it was about getting scale uh, from an eon perspective and and also whilst getting scale, also having that diversity across different countries and different uh, diff, you know, different countries. So you're not too exposed to one regulatory and political regime. So I think that's the... Yeah, interesting. And, and thank, thank you for the detailed answer. Does it, just yes. on that point of two growth areas, so it sounds like from what you, this is to some extent, Eon could have gone either way, right? It could have gone renewables, it could have gone networks, but it yeah. wanted the, the scale. Is... So I, I compare that to SSE, right, which is, you know, you're a director of its networks and its renewables at the same time. Yeah. Do you see a big difference in terms of the benefit? So, so you, you've got a diversified portfolio and two growth areas in SSE. Uh, so you're foregoing scale to an extent. Uh, now, history matters in all of these things. Do you, see a, do you see a big difference in the efficiency that scale could, could bring? So, as you say, SSE has rationalized and focused our portfolio to get two clear growth businesses, networks and renewables and adjacent businesses. And in our view and my view, we have very good capabilities in each of these businesses and we have world class scale in offshore wind, which is actually where the biggest scale economies are. Let me just unpack that argument a bit. Networks, of course, there's substantial growth from enabling the energy transition. I think we, we all know, know that. Renewables, and we also all know there's huge growth globally, also for the energy transition. SSE is very strong in, in GB in Ireland with a good forward pipeline. We're constructing more offshore wind than any other company at present, and we're clearly a scale player. We have excellent capabilities in developing, building, and operate, operating wind in general. And we're looking to take those capabilities and grow in other markets, either organically or by buying a platform. So for example, we, we bid on project four in, in Denmark recently. Uh, we were one of the leading bidders, but the final outcome was determined by a lottery. And we unfortunately didn't win the, didn't win, didn't win the lottery. We've agreed an MOU with uh, Akiona for developments of offshore wind in Iberia and Poland. And we acquired an 80% stake in Pacifico Energy offshore wind platform business in, uh, in Japan. And also over the last three years, we've transformed the business by disposing of a substantial set of non-core businesses. So the GB residential retail business, um, our 50% of our telecoms business, uh, our stake in SGN, Scotia Gas Networks, our ENP business, and our 50% stake in our energy from waste business to First Sentier. So we've focused down the portfolio to those two growth businesses, networks and renewables, with complementary business, businesses such as trading, portfolio management, which leverages our world-class scale and capabilities in offshore wind. And we set out a very ambitious 12.5 billion investment plan over the next five years, which was substantially larger than our previous investment plan. So in a way, I think the transformations of E.ON and RWE and SSE are very consistent stories of focus and seeking scale in growth markets yeah okay interesting yeah and um I, I, just just one more thing on the network growth story one thing that's that i worry about is that in in democracies basically particularly sort of developed democracies network may not be a growth area and it's actually really hard to you know it's particularly at the transmission level i suppose at the distribution level maybe it's slightly different but we seem to be uh 
not investing in networks where you might have you know public concern about nimbyism and those sorts yeah. of things we seem to be trying to look for every alternative there's a huge focus on long duration storage which which is partly about shifting power between time um, but but it's also partly, partly and a big chunk of it is about easing network congestion mm-hmm. so we're looking for all sorts of other solutions do, do you what gives you confidence that networks is a growth area um, you know, in, in a world in which planning is harder, people don't like building wires over their heads. Uh, you know, we see it in California where the pg and is spending a fortune putting networks underground. We see it in Germany where you've got huge congestion from north to south. Yep. Uh, we're seeing it in the UK, see it in Australia, we see, see it everywhere. What, what makes you confident that this will be a growth area? Yeah, so I think so two or three things. First of all, I think, you know, the fundamental need to shift more power around so that you know, with the transition to, for example, off, offshore wind, north of Scotland, onshore wind, et cetera. So the fundamental need to shift that power, plus the fundamental need for network reinforcement to, net, to enable electric vehicles and heat pumps. You know, all of those drive a need to reinforce the network. Absolutely agree that there will be opportunities to not invest by doing, by doing something different, you know, by putting in local storage or what have you, which, and if that's the right thing from a overall system cost point of view, it's better cost to the end customer and to society, then, then fine. But those opportunities are, whilst they're there, they're way not big enough to offset the huge growth opportunity in, in, yeah. in, um, in, in their ways. And then on some of the nimbyism piece, I think particularly around transmission, there's just you know, there's, there's the opportunity to bring in a lot of that transmission under the North Sea, for example, or down, you know, down the coast, um, and um, which should reduce, you know, reduces that, challenge yeah because it's, it's out of sight out of mind yeah yeah and, and they're bringing it on shore but that's uh, but we'll come back to that later i guess yeah, yeah. no and it's, and it's hard to get away from the fact that power consumption on any scenario looks like it's going to massively yeah. increase it's, it's, and it's, it's right. going to be variable so we're going to have to cater to a bigger network peak than we might have otherwise yeah. and and you go from there and and it may well be that the right owner of storage assets this is this is you know this is going to be controversial with some might be network companies in in some context. Um, okay, just, so changing it, the boundary between it, well, it, it just depends, right? I mean, I think in the nodal markets that doesn't matter very much. You know, you, your price your price actually does a lot of work on congestion or, or almost all the work. So um, so generators you know generators can make the right investments. Whereas in a lot of other markets, I mean, certainly Europe, you, we don't have any anything like the price signal to the, the you know no. People aren't in many markets at all internalizing the congestion problem yeah. with their with their location decisions. Yeah. Um, so so maybe the networks play a play a role. I think yeah. It was a good example a few years ago of the South German reserve, which I think it was it was um, ENBW's network business just built some diesel pe- uh, peaking okay. plants in in the south. They just yeah. sort of said, Let, "Look, we'll just put this in the regulated asset base and and you know don't worry too much about it." Kind of thing. So these these sorts of things happen. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, the point, it's really interesting because talking about the network business is an interesting and exciting growth opportunity, whereas you know, way back when uh, it was, you know, networks were considered boring. Yeah. Um, and I think actually one of the decisions that Eon, if you were to ask Johannes Tyson what, de- what, what decisions related to the UK he would regret would be selling central networks. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I have. It's a topic for another conversation, Tony. But I, the 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 fears I have around networks is that they are these monopolies, um, and so you know my my hypothesis is the level of innovation in networks has been much slower than it has been in generation and in retail markets, uh, and that it's just you know any any solution provider is selling to either one person or in the UK you know you might have eight different distribution yeah. networks where security, you know, there, there's a very low, quite rightly, based on history and culture, there's an extremely low appetite for risk. Um, so my, my concern, I, I think we're going to need a lot more networks, 
the, but I, I wonder if there's a few options that we're overlooking because um, because of, of risk aversion or something. Yeah. You, okay. you may that's have a maybe a different it. It's a conversation for another time. I'm not as concerned as you are, but I, I can okay. see what the risk okay. of that is. Yeah. Okay. Is it just a provocative question? So RWE share price has gone up a lot in the last few years. Eons has has not. Um, does does this mean does this mean RWE got it? I, I mean, to some extent, this is a function of. Um, relative valuation changes for renewables versus networks, right? Allstead went up, you know, whoever it was, is pure play renewables business, you know, NL, the uh, Iberdrola have all done really well because they own power of renewables generation and the long-term contracts that were, that were connected to the generation assets in many cases. Um, is RWE the winner of the asset swap or, or is it too early to say? I think it's too early to say. Yeah, okay. So I think, yeah, absolutely. And I should add, uh, we, we did have Bernhard Günther on episode 31 of the podcast. So if you'd like to go deeper on the story of E.ON, the demerger, the, the asset swap, uh, Bernhard had a, had a front row seat there as, as, as well. Uh, so you might want to have a look at that one too. Um, one final question on, on the, whole, the whole sort of court strategy for utilities. Do you have a do you have a, a thought in mind? And this relates to your point around RWE, Eon, and SSE are all pursuing a focused strategy. Now they're all also pursuing quite an international strategy at the moment. I think you would say of, of the of the capital markets days of the future strategy, internationalization play, plays a role. Um, and yet, you you know, the, the Eon lesson was maybe they got a little bit too diversified, um, whether it was geographically or from a business unit perspective. Do you have simple rules of thumb in, in, in terms of which circumstances utility should be international? Yeah, I think where there are economies of scale and clear capabilities that you can take from your home market to a, a new market, um, uh, either with or without a partner yeah um and you know there's always a i think there's always a trade-off between effectively international scale and local knowledge and so in many of these markets a local you know a local partner is is or a either a local partner or or, or acquiring a scale platform is essential um and i think you know that's you know there's there's some there's plenty of of, of example of positive examples of that. Uh, there's also plenty of, of examples where you know the choice of the market or the choice of the partner didn't work. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, excellent. So, so we've talked about some of the companies you've been involved with and their strategies and the ra- rationale for that. Let, well, let me just just one more on the in, SSE Infinis point. You're you're a chair of Infinis. You're a director of SSE. Do you think the role of a director has gotten harder in the utility space than it than it was? I, I've been a director, as in a FTSE director, rel- for a relatively short period of time. Obviously, I was a director of, of Eon UK, but that was within a, a corporate umbrella, so slightly different. I do think the role of a director is appears to be harder than it was in the past, but I think that's entirely justified you know society's expectations of these companies are higher and therefore there is a requirement for directors to make sure they're rigorously over the detail and really are considering the stakeholder requirements in each of these businesses yeah interesting you're not in even with directors who have been FTSE directors for, for decades, I think that's a common a common theory. Is a, a common theory is that it's gotten more complicated, it's gotten more challenging, and they can list the reasons. But um, uh, it's 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 interesting an interesting change. Do you think that applies to non utilities as well? Is that just generally the level th- of scrutiny is so. higher? Yeah, I think yeah. I, I think also and uh, to to non utilities. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, why did you choose just on SSE and Infinis, I mean, and I remember us talking before you left your role at, mm. at, um, at Eon. Why did you choose SSE and Infinis? You know, you could have gone in a bunch of di- directions. Obviously, you wanted to do some some nonprofit work as well, which you've which you've which you've been doing. Um, what attracted you to those companies? Well, I think they're they're um, they're both super businesses with. Um, 
great opportunities in the renewables space and network space in the case of SSE. Um, so that's sort of analytically great opportunities. Emotionally, uh, they're, they're also very good teams um, and you know, a great culture in each case. And if I think about, you know, so just peeling that onion a little bit, you know, SS, SSE has, I think, always been a very good corporate citizen. The team, you know, if you go, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really inspirational. If you go to the front line and see the work that people are doing up in the hydro stations or go to, you know, out on the distribution network or the call center, you know, there's, there's that real passion of doing the right thing. And that is all the way through, through the organization. And then I think also with SSE, um, you know, it's a, it's a good executive team. Uh, and these guys, you know, having been in the sector for 20 years as a competitor with them, these guys have made some really good strategic decisions over the years. So that, that, that's the sort of combination that attracted me to, to SSE. And as that, you know, that's absolutely turned out, right? You know, we've honed the portfolio, focused it. And in SSE, that's absolutely, you know, that my preconceptions have proved to be absolutely right. We've sharpened the business, focused the business, and it's a, it's a great place to be. And it's a privilege to be a director. Um, at Infinis, you know, it's a much, it's for sure it's a much smaller business. You get your hands around it. Um, and um, but there's a really good, it's a great, there's a really good management team. There's, again, there's a good ethos throughout the business. It's a great platform expand you know, of, of an engineering and O&M capability in operating distributed generation assets. And we're building on that to expand into solar batteries and peakers. Um, and we've got a really good shareholder in 3IN who's supporting supporting that growth um, and, and supportive of us really pushing on that sustainability agenda. Great. And just, just a small question from SSE. So SSE was a major sponsor of COP. How do you, and presumably that costs money, how do you know if you got value for money out of that? Uh, you know, there's a sort of well, well-known well adage in, in marketing. Yeah, which that it's half sort of, of it? Yeah, yeah ex- exactly. You know, half of it's working and half of it isn't, but I don't know which half. But do you, you know, how do you, how do you think about doing that? Do you, are you happy with the outcome? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think um, it was very good for SS, SSE and you know, really enabled it to demonstrate its credentials on a national and world stage. Great. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the industry. Um, and as we move, I, I should also just add, um, we talked a little bit about when a, when a utility should go international uh, from recollection in episode 53 with Stefan Jörg Goebel uh, from Statcraft. He gave a very informed response on that question as well. So if you're thinking more about internationalization of utilities, that's, that's, a, that's a good episode as well. But okay, so the first thing I'd like to focus on is the topic of the hour right now, which is the British retail market. Now, most of our listeners aren't from the UK. So just to give a little bit of context on this to our listeners, and Tony, you can tell me if I'm wrong because you were were there. But my take is 10 years ago, the British retail power market, it's often called the supply market, was uh, concentrated. There are a small number of participants and they tended to be vertically integrated in the sense that they owned generation and retail uh, customers. Uh, In general, I think there was a sense of customer dissatisfaction. Uh, Some of it was around quality of service. Some of it was around pricing and cost. To me, at least, I think often those two things get blamed when commodity prices are going up. Uh, And if you're a retail business and your underlying commodity is going up, unfortunately, you're going to get blamed for it to an extent. Um, As often happens with retail power, politics was a big issue. Uh, there was a there was a competition authority, a major competition authority inquiry into the British retail market. Uh, there was a political campaign that was run on uh, capping prices, so intervening in the market uh, so that prices couldn't rise above a certain level. 
uh, and certainly a number of measures were taken that would ease entry into the market uh, and indeed support, get, give a sort of structural cost advantage to smaller participants. All of this led, I think some would have argued two years ago, to great success. We, we went from you know, about 10 suppliers to 70-odd. Uh, competition was high. You know, there's quite a bit of innovation. I think the UK has been a hotbed for innovation in retail. Uh, but also there was quite a bit of poor management because it was easy to enter the sector and, and there were just a lot of subscale sub operators in a market in which economies of scale matter for things like hedging, marketing, uh, those sorts of things. And, and then I suppose the final straw was we had this sort of once in a, once in a generation commodities boom over the last six months um, and, and that cleaned out a bunch of people who hadn't hedged that, that exposure. So that's my take on history, Tony. Uh, two questions. One of one of which is, you know, have I have I got it broadly right? Um, but then, if if you accept that I've got it broadly right, so the first question is, why was everyone angry at the big six suppliers t eight ten years ago? Do, do you think it was justified? So, uh, yeah. The first thing I would maybe push back on, or not push back on, but highlight is the language of the big six. So in in Eon, we really did push, we didn't use that word, that phrase internally, it, but it was a bit of language that impli was implied that there were six players who were, who were colluding, who were all the same, et cetera. And, and actually there were more than six players, but the six largest players, um, each, they had different strategies, different approaches, and actually internally to many, in many dimensions had different uh, cultures, yeah. So, I, so I think so. I think that that will be one, one thing I would say. I think the the, the um, but why was was some of the anger justified? I think the you know, the, the market was liberalised with the view that you know energy, power, and gas are just any other commodity or any other service. So you know, it's like it's like home insurance, it's like car insurance, it's like financial services. Uh, it's like telecoms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, the, some of, you know, the companies did adopt some of the practices of those other industries, uh, which did result, uh, for you know, the selling practices, the marketing practices, and the, which, some of which were just, they're just, they're just, Playing wrong in any you know, now in, with the, the benefit of hindsight are playing wrong in any industry. Some of this of the doorstep selling, for 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 example, um, some of the practices are uh, you know market some of the marketing approaches. Um, by that time, given the price the price increases that you described, some of which were commodity and some of which were due to the um, Put some of the, some of the, the subsidies for um, renewables on the bills, uh, or the various subsidies on the bills, um, those might be acceptable in some markets, but became unacceptable in the power and gas market. Yeah. So, so I think you know. So, I think the company started to recognise this. I think Offgem started to recognise this. Um, at but and there was a sort of media. It's a combination of media and political pressure, uh, which um, really caused uh, you know a, almost a maelstrom on the the, the the big six. You highlighted in your pre comments the CMA. So actually, I asked for a CMA inquiry mm -hmm. right, very publicly, and 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 actually the CMA inquiry was quite helpful in dampening down the noise for quite some time while they were doing doing the analysis um, but I think the coming out of the CMA there was a you know the majority view of the CMA if you remember the CMA's view was that the market needed more engagement you know, to get encourage customers to switch etc. Um, and there was a minority view that the market might have a, that a price cap would be prepared, but the market minority view was Martin Cave. Yeah? Um, 
subsequently politics put in place the, 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 the price cap. I think if we come all the way forward to today, the lessons learned would be absolutely we should encourage switching and make switching really, really easy for customers. There are some industrial reasons why market entry barriers went down. You know, using um, software packages became much easier and, and less, more cost effective than, than historical legacy systems. But around many people underestimated the risk from the commodity markets. Um, when I say, you know, I think the CMA has underestimated it. I think Ofgem underestimated it. And I think a number of the new entrants underestimated it. And yes, this year has been unprecedented, but it wasn't completely unforeseeable. And there have been commodity blips in the past. And actually, you know, when, I, when I first came into the retail leadership position in 2011, some of my colleagues at the time said, look, there's a wave of new entrants. Some of them are going to be swept out by a commodity price spike at some point. And that was in 2011. Yep. Yeah. And, and so um, I, do th- I do think that is a clear thing, that a clear lesson we need to learn. And I know, you know the, today, we're, re- you know, the re- we're recording it today, yesterday, um, Jonathan Brilly set out some views or, or some proposals on stress tests for uh, players in the market. I absolutely think that's the right direction of travel. Whether he's got the, the scale of the stress test correct or, or not, uh, we'll, we'll see. We need to read the detail. But absolutely, we should make sure that people are really thinking about the risks, uh, the commodity risks in the market. Okay, so yes, and we're recording this on the 16th of December 2021. So it sounds like you're supportive of the CMA. You were probably, we needed more nuance on the ease of entry and and tighter requirements for people entering the market. Where where were you on the, where are you or where were you on the price cap? Do do you think this is a sensible structure uh, that was poorly implemented or a good structure that just sometimes these things happen? Or yeah, what's your, what's your sense on that one? Because it's not just a British topic, right? Australia, you know, jurisdictions in Australia have price caps. Not, it's not particularly un, un, uncommon. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd rather we didn't have it, but I, and I think once we've got it, it's going to stay. It's very hard to take it away, and therefore we have got it. So we need to make it work. Yeah. But we okay. need to adjust it to make it work. Yeah. And to be fair, it has protected customers this year from the immediate impact of these gas price and power price changes. Mm-hmm. Of course, that some of that will come back and you know, has to be paid for in due course. Yeah. yeah. And, and so just to follow up on that one then, so zoom ahead two years from now, um, what do you think the GB retail market looks like? And specifically, you know, how many people do you think are still, still in the market and, and are they making money? So... I think you know, two years from now, I, you know, I would I'd say there'll be ten to twenty scale players, um, and um, some of which are making money, some of which some of which aren't. Um, but those with a good low cost to serve, um, good marketing, good customer service, so they're they're, they're attracting customers and retaining customers. Uh, and those who are developing new propositions for the energy transition, so le- you know, smart, uh, smart, uh, so uh, electric vehicles, and then in due course, um, heat pumps, uh, smart meters, all of that, that nexus. Those will be successful in two years' time, and particularly the ones with the smart proposition successful over the longer term. Yeah, I mean, one of the nice aspects of the last period in GB retail is, I, look, I think it could be a hotbed of innovation for the rest of the world, right? You know, Octopus's yes, software platform um, being uh, being exported to Australia, to Japan, to Texas, you know, all of Germany, Spain, uh, all of that, OVO is doing similar things. And, and one of the nice things has been the ease with which these companies, I say ease, they probably didn't feel like that internally, but with which these companies can raise money. And, yeah, and yeah. Octopus, uh, you know, over they were saying, look, we're losing money, but don't worry about it. Our cost to serve is low. 
Uh, this is a scale game and it's not just a national scale game. It's a global scale game. Mm. Um, so, the, the, you know, there've been some very positive outcomes. I, I don't know. I do wonder if we'll look back. Let, let's see. It hinges on the software, but I wonder if it we'll hinge, look back. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the software. It, yeah. Cool. Five or 10 years from now and say, wow, yeah. you know, that, that was, that's a contribution to the world on the or same order of magnitude from welfare perspective as you know, developing the offshore wind industry or something, or, or the AstraZeneca virus, maybe not quite the maybe AstraZeneca virus, but, but, you know, that that sort of uh, British innovation and contribution to the rest of the world. Um, just one more question, and then I want to close out with a final segment. But um, what, broad question, what reform would you make now to most ease the transition to net zero? So I think improving the planning for offshore on on sh offshore wind onshore wind solar so that it's faster to bring to market and that would include also the, the you know, getting the network connections in including those in the in the north sea um and it you know just reminded me you know the scroby sands i think took about the same it, it took a long time to develop scroby sands it's taken a similar time to develop um uh dog a bank <clears throat> you know we've got we've managed to improve everything else but we've not managed to improve reduce the time the cycle time of planning and that yeah. is absolutely critical to get the 80 percent um decarbonization of the sector yeah of the yeah. sector and then to enable other sectors to decarbonize yeah yeah you you will tell me that of, yeah Tony, that's fine but we also need to do the final you know final uh 800 Big, hours and those yeah. gonna be really expensive yeah okay i'm focusing on the first five you know first eight thousand hours now how do yeah. you get those really quickly deep yeah up? And, and good old scoby sands was there much public uh, was there much public uh, concern about the presumably the tiny turbines although admittedly Megawatt, probably yeah. close to sit close to shore with that concern shore, so, yeah 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 okay interesting um Good. What was the revenue model for Scoby Sands, by the way? Rocks. Okay. It was it was early, early um, sure. re renewable obligation yeah. certificates? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. And by by improving planning, it sounds like you're implicitly saying this is this isn't just nimbyism. This isn't human nature. There's something to do with the process of resolving disputes and getting things built that you think there's a better way. Yeah. Absolutely. And and. And, and actually, there might be some human nature thing. So, so it's so, you know, obviously from an SSE perspective, you kind of focus on 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 offshore wind, where the big bucks, are, the big bang for the buck, or the big big assets are. But from an infinite point of view, getting a solar farm approved is also more time consuming than it should be. You know, um, we know at a national level, we know we need to get these things built. And then you, leave, you read the local newspaper and there, you know, there's, there's still quite a lot of nimbyism. Do you know, we really need to use this farmland for this, et cetera? Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. And I went to a separate conversation. I, I think it all it gets harder once you go into people's homes as well. You're talking about oh, gas absolutely. boilers. Yeah. You're talking about yeah. removing gas boilers and things like that is another, another level of... Um, of concern politically, yeah. so that'll be an interesting one when we when we when we get to it. I'm um, good. I'd like to conclude by asking you about a couple of concepts in the energy yeah. transition, just to see if you think they're overrated or underrated. Uh, no need to elaborate, of course. Feel free to if you like. Um, let me start with the role of gas in the power sector over the next 15 years. Um, this is something you know a lot about. SSE's built the the last, the most modern CCGD plant, uh, KB KB2. Uh, and obviously, Infinis is 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 a is a gas is a yeah. is a carbon free gas generator. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you see as the role of gas in the power sector? Underrated. Underrated. Okay. Yeah. Taken for granted and underrated. Uh, yeah. And if we continue to take it for granted, it might not be there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. I have to entirely agree with you. Uh, one thing that I think listeners should watch out for is the German context on, on this. You know, we've had Marcus Kreber from RWE talking about 25 to 30 
gigawatts of new CCGT. Uh, Patrick Eichen, the new state secretary, uh, has acknowledged the role for, you know, Green Green Party, uh, Exegor has acknowledged the need for gas in Germany. Uh, slightly different context, but um, it seems like, you know, there's a recognition, you know, from dis- decision makers about the the role of gas and what needs to happen now. Um, next, the role of markets in decarbonizing the electricity sector. Uh, I'm talking about locational markets. I'm talking about wholesale markets. Do you think their role is overrated or underrated? I think it's about th- those markets. I think it's about right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, but I don't I have to so within that, if you went on to that, the next level of question of do we th- the role of merchant markets in uh, enabling, for example, offshore wind, I would say overrate it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've heard okay. people, other people on your podcast say, oh, well, merchants will be fine. Yeah. yeah. Given all of my previous conversations about trading, I'm not convinced. And, and, and so let me just go one deeper on that then. Right. Does that mean there's a role for government or does that mean we need longer term financial contracts and that they will evolve absent government intervention, whether that's, you know, what for, you know, there's a sufficient carbon price, someone wants to buy the power, whether it's a vertically integrated retailer or whether it's Google or Amazon or whatever, which one of those two do you think is the answer? I still, I think in these big things, I think there's still a role for government in setting up some form of framework like the CFD framework that we have here in, in, in the, in the UK, which might well be, it's, it's not a subsidy. It's setting up a framework and, you know, some years it will pay to the generator and some years it will pay back. Okay. Okay. And uh, finally, a vertical integration between generation and retail supply, uh, overrated or underrated? Overrated. Okay. I think vertical integration between generation and trading and vertical integration between retail and trading, both underrated. Okay. Uh, Absolutely essential and underrated. Okay. Interesting. Uh, and generation and trading, you mean on the both both on the upstream and the downstream side, presumably. Yeah. So, so right. you know, you went back. You went. You talked about the Eon split because when Eon split and, and uh, spun off Uniper, so the trading floor went with Uniper. So Eon then had to build a new trading floor or a new trading capability. You have to have that in a retail market. It goes back to our final point about the UK. Yeah. Situation yeah. Have. Okay. So good news for traders out there and consistent yeah. with your view that it's not a bad place to start your career in the power yeah. sector. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, that's a, that's a great note to finish on Tony. Uh, so thanks so much for taking the time, sharing your depth of expertise across the sector, across time. Uh, so uh, Tony Cocker, thanks so much for taking the time to speak. John, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. That was John Federson, founder and CEO of Aurora, talking to Tony Cocker, Senior Independent Director of SSE PLC. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.